Welcome to Beyond Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Petralis, and we are super excited for today's guest. Uh, you know, this dude's really inspiring. If you check out his stuff on Instagram, that's kind of where I found him. His story is so interesting. To me, there's not many people who can hang their hat on the fact that they play collegiate football in all three divisions. And this guy's telling an inspiring story today of how he's doing that and accomplished that. Not many people can say they've done that. And that's something, no matter what, that no one can take from him and just showing his like, hard work and work ethic. Uh, we're super excited to have him on here. Um, so without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Jared Martino. Appreciate you having me on. I'm excited we were able to finally make this happen. I uh, can't wait to dive into my story a little bit, chop it up with you. And uh, yeah, I'm super, super excited we were able to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is great. And, 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 uh, you know, you're a local, you're a local guy, a Malden guy, and, and I'm a Mefford guy, but I show Malden love. Mefford people hate on me sometimes. Well, anyway. <laughs> um, but in all honesty, just to shout out Malden here, you're a Malden guy, and we'll talk about your stats and what you did. You did some incredible things. Uh, but Malden was the first city that really bought into us beyond podcasts and what we were trying to do for high school coaches that has now really kind of shifted more what we're doing for high school athletics teams and obviously athletes and individual athletes uh and they saw the vision we cover everything there uh and you know we got to cover the game at fenway they gave us all access vip like everywhere i mean they've treated us so good so to be able to now kind of like give back to them even more in different ways to tell a guy a local guy's story who like i said i think is inspiring and young athletes who listen in our especially our like listening range 18 to 24 is huge dude and this is the range that is going to your stories going to knock out of the park so we're super excited for that um, but yeah, you were QB. I mean, you played a million different positions, but in Malden, you were all world quarterback. And I confidently say that I have my notes here. I don't have like your stats as far as passing yards. You could probably tell me all that, but I know like one season you had 40 offensive TDs. I think this is your senior season, 25 passing TDs, 15 rushing TDs. You're the all-time leading passer, the first quarterback in Malden to rush for a thousand yards and single season leading passer in yards. Did I miss something? No, you covered it all pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely did your homework. Uh, dude, so talk about that. I mean, you, obviously you play Everett, like Everett is all world team that you play. And statistically, you know, I definitely heard your name. And, and the more I kind of started doing the homework, the more I've been like, okay, like I know I've heard this name locally. This makes sense. I mean, talk about playing a mall in your career there and really just kind of that's where it got started for you. Yeah, so um, started playing football when I was five. I uh, started playing for the Malden Cyclones, the Pop Warner program in Malden. Uh, my dad was a coach, sister was a cheerleader, brother was a player, mom was a team mom. So, you know, it was kind of just in our roots of just becoming a, a football player. And then just seeing like all the great Malden Pop Warner teams and all the athletes, like, you know, just going to practice every day, like, oh, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that guy. So, yeah, so played at Malden, I played Malden Pop Warner. And then I kind of played like everywhere in Pop Warner, like running back lineman like every, every position you can think of I played in Pop Warner yeah. and then um, my eighth grade year is when I actually started to play quarterback because I always wanted to play quarterback I was like I mean who doesn't want to play quarterback? right I mean especially <laughs> like, so so yeah I finally got the chance to play quarterback and then uh went to Malden High and you know because my brother was a quarterback at Malden High before too so I was able to play quarterback there too and it was it was awesome I, I'm forever grateful growing up in Malden just being in the city yeah, so my my main question is how how did you not end up playing for Everett at some point? Because usually they kind of scoop the best players from yeah. all around. So it's amazing that you were in Malden the entire time too, which is yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I, I mean all the dudes I played with, you know, they ended up <laughs> making that switch going to Everett. But uh, for me, I don't know. I always just kind of wanted to be that guy that you know didn't do that that was just always kind of something instilled in me. Like you know, everyone was going to Everett, but I looked at it as not. Nah, I want to be the guy that's that beats Everett. I want to be a part of something that no one else has done. So that was kind of always the thing for me. And I also think too, they didn't even try getting me because they kind of knew my family, my brother, my dad, like it, it was just no way I could do that. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy too, you know, and, and that's amazing to me because yeah, you throw up those type of numbers, especially your senior season, you have all world. I mean, we cover Malden football a lot. Truthfully, we've covered a lot of their games in season and their things, the last three Thanksgiving games that they've had, we've done all their coverage. Uh, so it's really cool to, to that connection. And then obviously from there, you went, you went like uh prep school, I think for your Cheshire Academy. Yeah. I went to Cheshire uh, Academy. Yep. 
And you, dude, you were like, you played a bunch of different positions, both sides of the ball. But here I have you, the first prep player of the year for their school. You had two 1,000 yard rushing seasons. And then as far as offers went from there, like you more FCS mm -hmm. uh, offers you were getting. But talk about, you know, your experience here. I mean, two years. I mean, obviously you tore it up as a back there. Um, and then coming out of that, seeing the offers that you had. And then kind of the theme, I think, is you betting on yourself a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, got recruited to go play baseball. I was, was originally to play baseball. A lot of people growing up in Malden kind of always thought baseball was going to be my sport. At one point in my life, I did too. But I just kind of, you know, it was just football. It just gave me a love that I just never really experienced before. So I go to Cheshire to play football and baseball. And, uh, yeah, those two years, it was unreal just, you know, being able to play against that competition. You know, you're going to practice every day. This guy has these offers. This guy's going here. So there wasn't any days you could really take off. So it was – it definitely made me into a better football player. But overall, definitely made me into a, a much better man, too. I was able to grow up, obviously, on my uh, on my own for the first time from Malden and then went out there and lived in Connecticut for two years. So, um, yeah, it was uh, – Cheshire was a unique experience because obviously like living there and then just being able to meet so many different people. Like I always looked at it as like two different worlds because, you know, you grow up in Malden, you know, blue collar city. And then you get to go to a prep school where you're going to class with kids that their parents own this. And, you know, just crazy. Just just being able to be around that. It was like it really allowed me to just be diverse with people and kind of, you know, always just uh, no matter the situation. Like I feel like I can talk to anybody because of that, you know. Yeah, and I think that that's great. And so, like, obviously for you, I mean, fast forwarding just a little bit, like you decided to go JUCO route at one point. Here you are deciding yeah. to go prep school route. Did, talk about that decision making for you, because we have a lot of young high school kids that listen mm -hmm. to this. You decided to go prep school for two years. What was the decision of doing that versus maybe trying to play college right out the gate a little bit? Um, I kind of – so, honestly, I just the, – the, the opportunity to go prep school was just – it was hard to pass up on. Yeah. Uh, not too many people from that area get that opportunity and obviously like a football move, but at the same time too, just a, a life move in general, just being able to make those type of connections and meet those type of people. Like it, it's priceless. I, I made some of my best friends. Like I have connections for the rest of my life. So it was, that was kind of the main thing. It was just, it, it just felt like an opportunity that was too hard to pass up on. Yeah. And for you, you seem like just wanted to experience something different, see something right. different, like you said, be around different people and experience that, which is great. And obviously you tore it up there. I mean, I threw the numbers out there, the stats, and you were the first player in their school history to win, like, what was it? The player of the year, play school player yeah. of the year, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but you had FCS offers. Mm -hmm. Talk about those a little bit, because what I find interesting is, you, you obviously contemplated that, but you ended up making a different decision and going a different route. Mm -hmm. um, to you, were you disappointed in that? Was that something you expected maybe a little bit more? I mean, the schools that were reaching out to you, I mean, right. as far as that decision went, how, what was that thought process? Yeah, so um, going into the, the year before I won Prep School Player of the Year, I had no offers. Like I had some D3 schools talking to me. It wasn't, I went to a couple camps. Um, Boston College said they weren't going to offer me. UMass wasn't going to offer me. UConn wasn't going to offer me. So I had a lot of motivation going into that senior year. And then obviously winning prep school player of the year, I thought that, okay, now the offers are going to roll in and now I'm finally going to get what I feel like I deserve. But um, unfortunately, it, it didn't really go out like that. So Sacred Heart offered me and then Merrimack offered me. But at the time, they weren't full scholarships. Okay. So I was teetering around the fact, okay, if I, you know, I go there, I'm paying every year. Or I could go walk on, bet on myself, only have to pay one year potentially, and then be on scholarship for the rest of my college career. So that's where it kind of came down to. Looking back on it, you know, I could have made a couple of different decisions because at the end of the day, like a D1 opportunity is 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 a blessing. You know, FCS, FBS, no matter even any any college opportunity is a blessing. To be able to play at the next level, you're a stud. So looking back on it, I was definitely a little hard headed. You know, I thought, oh, I need this is what I need. I I need to go here. I'm I'm too good to go there which I wish I didn't think like that, but, you know, kind of comes full circle now that my whole, it's kind of changed. So, so that was my thought process while I was in high school. So. 
And I think that that's the risk of kind of betting on yourself in a lot right. of ways, right? Because you, you know, you, you know, your limits, you know what you want, right? And mm -hmm. you're knowing what you're willing to put yourself through to kind of get there. So, you know, I, you, like you say, looking back on it, maybe like you're right. Any offer is, is a blessing, right. but you wanted more for yourself and you swung for it. Like mm -hmm. people don't always decide to make that decision and so Very on. True. So you bet on yourself, which is a common theme of you just kind of doing my homework on you. And something that really kind of drew me to be like, man, this kid is something. Um, talk about going to UMass a little bit and that decision making and saying like, this is the opportunity for me to now be able to prove that I am D1 talent and that I can be a full scholarship uh, football player. Yeah. So um, it came down between Rutgers and UMass. So I had prefer walk-ons to both. And originally, I was leaning towards Rutgers because they had actually came and saw two of our games. We had two games in New Jersey my senior year, and they were at both games. In both games, like, I lit it up. So I thought they were eventually going to offer me, but that wasn't yeah. the case. So I don't know. I kind of just Big Ten. I was like, oh, I can go play those schools. Like, it, I was really attracted to it. One of my boys was going to Rutgers, too. But then once I really, you know, sat back and thought about it, it was very, very expensive to do that. Yeah. UMass kind of just made the most sense because it was in-state tuition. Uh, they had a whole new coaching staff. So I felt like this is a good opportunity. Like they're looking for guys to play. They don't care scholarship, non-scholarship transfer. Like they want the best product on the field. So it made the most sense at the time to make that decision and go to UMass. And talk about experiencing, because I know you in this leaving, but a lot of it was also to like a season ending injury. Like you right. got banged up, mm -hmm. um, you get banged up. You kind of sit and contemplate those type of things. I mean, right. You decide to leave, um, which ended up probably being a great decision for you because mm -hmm. obviously you play a Juco and we'll talk about that, but talk about that process a little bit into, you know, you're a guy who bets on yourself. You're sitting there. What, what were you thinking there as far as like, man, what's my next step going to be? Yeah. So um, it was just frustrating at the time because obviously I'm a walk on, but then I get hurt. So now I'm really at the bottom of the totem pole. Like I'm, I'm climbing a steep, uh, a steep hill. So I don't know. I'm kind of just feeling like I'm not on the team, you know, going from where high school my career was. Yeah, I might not have the offers, but like I had a, a great high school career. So I just felt like, oh, I'm not used to feeling like this. You kind of just feel. Yeah, I just felt like I, like I said, I, I felt like I wasn't on the team. Um, it just didn't feel like the right situation for me, like got banged up right, like right when I got there. So it was just I couldn't even really show my talent because, boom, I got hurt right away. So. Yeah. And then the, the uh, like the next year came and I just didn't, it just, something just didn't feel right. And I just felt like I know my worth and I, they clearly, you know, felt how they felt about me. So I was like, no, nah, I, I can't, I can't do this to myself. Like I know that I can go somewhere and be the player I know I am. So that's when I decided to, to bet on myself again and, and enter the transfer portal. What type of back are you? Like, what type of back? Uh, you know, it's it, what, what's your first? What's your size? Like, what, what size? Uh, I'm about six one, and right now I'm about two thirty. I was probably like two twenty when I was at UMass. Okay, so okay. I was more just a downhill power back. There you uh, go. That was kind of just my game. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. you you play that type of style. I mean, for you, you play in a lot of different systems. Your systems yeah. make a difference. Like when right. you play, do they make a huge difference in your type of style of running? Yeah, honestly, looking back on it, I'm so glad I did make the move to linebacker because I feel like the downhill power back is slowly fading away from football. I think it's more of like you need your more like Christian McCaffrey speed kills. At the end of the day, it's something you can't teach right. <laughs> and you got to be able to do so much out of the back. So I think, you know, maybe 20 years ago, I would have been a great college running back. But unfortunately, that's not the times we're in anymore. So system is definitely huge, especially playing a like being that type of running back, you have to go into a system where, okay, they want to run downhill. They want to run power they They want to run inside zone. Like, so, and, and then that's obviously, you know, what they weren't trying to do. So. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about this. You enter the transfer portal, you decide to go Juco. I'm sure there were other offers there and not only go Juco, but you go Juco kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and you go Juco, Juco independence community. Um, and we all know that, um, you know, from Netflix and everything else. Uh, but talk about that decision because I mean, that's drastic, dude. Like yeah. that's not like you're leaving and going like stayed over or maybe a little further over. I mean, you're going halfway across the country and in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So initially when I um, told UMass I was leaving, I was kind of on the fence. I just wanted to see what I was kind of trying to pressure them. Yeah. Just like, okay. Tell them like, Oh, I'm thinking about it and see what they say. But <laughs> unfortunately that ended up being the shortest phone call I've had with a coach. 
Yes. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm leaving UMass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I do that. And then the transfer portal, it was fall of 2020. So we're kind of still like pandemic mode. Okay. Transfer portal, this is when the transfer portal first became a thing. Like it had never existed before. And this was like the first time it was a thing. So it was, the portal was insane. Yeah, it, I'm sure. <laughs> it, was, it was packed. So I had some schools talking to me. I thought I was going to end up at Merrimack or Sacred Heart just because they were the schools that offered me in high school. Yeah. Sacred Heart, the interest wasn't there anymore. And then Merrimack, that's where I thought I was going to end up. But they were kind of just, oh, we don't know with COVID pandemic. We don't really know what's good because they weren't even playing. Yeah. So they didn't know what was going to happen. So uh, it kind of was it was slow for a little bit. And then um, the offensive coordinator at Independence followed me on Twitter like randomly one day reached out to me he said, hey can you hop on a phone call and I was like yeah I mean I don't got any other phone calls from coaches like yeah I'm gonna hear what he has to say and uh he sold me he was obviously I knew what independence was from Netflix and I knew right. that yeah. so and then he was just saying hey you know you come here you have a good season you know you could potentially go bigger than UMass and right when he said that I was like okay I'm yeah sold. <laughs> I mean, and that, I mean, that's great. And I mean, you are literally in the middle of nowhere. I mean, yeah. going out there, but I would argue that that's probably the best talent you, that you would play with. Oh yeah. At that point, like you probably mm -hmm. walked out there being like, holy smokes, like this is, there's D one talent everywhere. And the backups are D one talent. Right. I mean, that's literally kind of everywhere. probably what you're dealing with. Yeah. No, when I got there, we had, I think 14 or 15 running backs. We had a bounce back from Cincinnati. He was a four-star in high school. We had a bounce back from, I think it was Charlotte. He was a four-star in high school from Georgia. Another kid that had a, he was another four-star. So I was just sitting here just like, dang, like this entire team. Right. Go D1. They either were at a D1 or they're about to go D1. So it was, it was absolutely insane. And you were the leading Russia there, right? You led yeah. them in Russian, right? So a yeah. lot of backs. I mean, your physicality style of running back. I mean, talk about, I mean, that's an accomplishment in itself to hear yeah. you say what the depth chart was and going out there. And again, you're moving cross country, you're a young kid, man. There's a lot of other adjustments you're making in life too, besides mm -hmm. playing football. Uh, yeah, you were the guy out there. So you were there. I know that led to something else, but talk about that season for you because you did tear it up. Yeah, no, it was a great season. Um, I knew, obviously, we had a lot of talent. So my biggest thing was I know I have to do the little things. I know I'm going to have to be in the playbook extra. I know I'm going to have to be, you know, in the weight room extra. I have to do all the little things that eventually add up to me getting that starting job. And I didn't get to start until week three. So I was rotating, rotating. Every time I got my opportunity, I made something happen, though. And then eventually they were like, okay, like, <laughs> we got to give this kid more opportunities because every time he touches the ball, he's doing something. So I eventually got the starting role and yeah, we were number two in the country at one point and I um, led the team in rushing at one point during the season, I was the leading rusher in the entire conference. It was, it was cause I had went from, I hadn't played in a game since 2018 and now fast forward to 2021. So it, it was a long time since I've been in the end zone. So yeah. it, it, I honestly, for a little bit kind of forgot what I could really do. Cause I just never, I hadn't done it. So it, the biggest thing for me was just being able to feel like myself again. So that was, that was the coolest thing about that season for sure. How religious are you? Very. Yeah. Like yeah. through all, like from, young no, years. honestly, no, <laughs> that's the okay. crazy thing. Okay. Um, it really started last year. I always like believed, but I was kind of like, oh, I don't, I didn't really know. I didn't grow up like that. I mean, I was Catholic, but we weren't really going to church or anything right, like right. that. And then this past year, I really, really, locked in on it and yeah it completely changed my life for the better for sure and what what if you don't mind me asking what was that change yeah so um what led me to it was I was just like I had left the school I so I went juco went to a school in Missouri yep. and I stopped playing football for a little bit and I was just really down a path that I was not used to I, I found myself kind of getting lost and I was just like, I don't I don't know what I'm doing I'm not in school I'm not playing football like kind of just feeling like I'm a failure, honestly, like just being completely transparent. I was just like, you know, yeah. once upon a time, everything was good, but now I feel like I'm at rock bottom and it just really allowed me to, and then, you know, an old coach reached out, you know, he kind of, you know, invited me to a Bible study and the, the title of the Bible study was casting your net one more time. So I was like, Oh, okay. I think I, I can, I think I'm picking up with what's, you know, what's being said. 
And yeah, I just, I feel like, you know, just overall, like I've just become, I'm just more at peace. Like that was the biggest thing. I was trying to find peace and I could never find it on my own. You know, I, I gave it all to God and like, you know, I, I was completely blessed this past year. You know, I, I feel like I'm a much, much better man than I, I was in the past. And overall, just that, that peace is something that, you know, I feel like a lot of people are searching for it and, you know, it, it's priceless at the end of the day. It's unreal. It's awesome. I mean, I, I just picked that up on you. Like, I was just like, this dude is like, because you have to be somewhat, you know, yeah. I think in, in betting on yourself and in, in kind of figuring out is football the right path for you? I'm sure right. you've had those conversations in your head a million times of like, right. is this, is this what I'm really supposed to be doing? Is 100%. this really like who I'm supposed to be? Right. Um, but you were at peace and that leads you, that led you still back to football. Uh, yeah. Talk about going to Framingham State because that's probably the year that changes your trajectory Everything. completely as far right. as that phone call. So where did that come from? You weren't playing for a while. Local yeah. coach, local college, D3 reaches out to you. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I'm not playing. I'm kind of I'm, I'm thinking about playing again. I'm reaching out to some schools, but, you know, I've already transferred UMass, Independence, Missouri. I'm, I'm going to be my fourth school. So people are like, okay are you the problem? Like what? Like, right. Right. People really don't want anything to do with me. Unfortunately, no one, they kind of were just like, okay, like you, you bounce around every year. Like clearly it's something that you're doing, which, you know, I totally understand. Like, so in, in Framingham, uh, I had known, so coach Bailey, he was the offensive coordinator last year. I had known him from high school because he used to coach at coastal Carolina mm-hmm. and in high school, one of my best friends was Isaiah likely. And yep. he, ends up going to coastal Carolina. So he was recruiting me a little bit, nothing crazy. He was mainly just trying to get Isaiah. So, so we had that connection from there. Cause my sister actually went to coastal Carolina too. So I went on a visit, met all them, like my junior year at Molden high. So I had known him just from that. we stayed in touch, followed each other on Twitter. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I saw that he was the offensive coordinator at Framingham state. I was like, how did that happen? Yeah, so yeah, we start, yeah. you know, we DM, it was actually crazy because someone tweeted something about Isaiah likely they were like, Oh, like, jared and isaiah were the duo back in the day and like they added me on twitter i was it was so random and then coach bailey actually liked the tweet so that's how i saw that he was at framingham and i was like what 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 do i got to lose i'm gonna reach out to him see how he's doing and i was like hey you know i'm thinking we're playing ball again like you know what what do you think and he was like yeah like we'd love to have you like i went on a visit and yeah, I was like, yeah, oh, I guess I'm about to play football again. <laughs> yeah, and you, and not only you go there, but also the drastic change, like your defensive coordinator, like kind of doing a little mm-hmm. homework on you, was pretty adamant about yeah. you switching the other side of the ball. I mean, you did play both sides of the ball, and obviously as a running back, I mean, line, linebackers essentially, I like the quarterback, running back, you know, right. backfield in in the defensive backfield. I mean, talk about that change. And was that something you were like, okay? Or were you like, did you battle it a little bit? Mm-hmm. I mean, what was that like thought process for you as far as that went? Yeah. So I originally was going to go to Framingham to play quarterback. Oh, just, wow. Yeah. I was like last year playing. It could be my last year playing football. Like, you know, I just have some fun. Like that, that was where I was at the beginning. Yeah. And then the defensive coordinator just, you know, hit like reached out to me during the summer and was like, Hey, like, you know, if you ever want a shot to play at the next level, I think your best bet would be to go play linebacker. I think you'd be a great linebacker. And I trusted what he was saying because he was a scout in the CFL for like five or six years. So he knows ball at the end of the day. So, you know, I was just like, you know what? Let's do it. Like Schools wanted me a lot of like in high school and stuff. Everyone always kind of told me, you know, defense, defense, defense. But, you know, playing a quarterback and then being running back, I kind of just wanted the ball in my hands. So I was like, no, no. And then, you know, I was just like, you know, I trust your opinion. I was like, hey what do I got to lose? Like, I'll do it. Like, let's do it. And that's how I decided to play linebacker. I mean, some of your highlight videos, like I've watched them and like our defensive coordinator. So like, like when we do like inside drill and stuff like that, defensively and want, like I live for that stuff. So I'm like watching your stuff like slowly and like slowing it down. I'm just like watching you read guards or down blocks and just getting around stuff so quick. I mean, that that guy's a genius. That guy's a genius. <laughs> but whatever it is yeah. that he saw, did he tell you what he saw? Like, what was it that he did see? I really, I, I think he just thought my size and like he saw me run a couple times and he was just like, hey, like that's the way the league's going now. You got to be an athletic linebacker, but you yeah. also have size. So he was, he was so 
yeah, he just, he was on it. He was like, I think you got to do it. You got to do it. And yeah, shout out to him because he completely changed my career. Coach McKenna, man, that's my guy. I mean, and so you go in and now you play in that first game. I mean, I couldn't find like real number mm-hmm. statistics as far as that went, but was there just like a first game or second game? Was there a game that you just exploded and people were like, who? I mean, because I'm like, here I have, I took notes. I'm just going through my messy notes here. But yeah, Framingham, you were uh, conference player of the year. You were a finalist national division three defensive player of the year. And you led the nation in tackles for loss. So we're not talking like, yeah, you had a strong season in conference. Like you had a strong national division three season that put you in a, a position to be the best defensive player in all of college football and defense th- division three. I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, it was, it was a crazy season. Um, yeah, it was nuts. It was, uh, if you would have told me that would have happened last year, I'd be like, you're crazy. I like, think I obviously always believe in myself, but you know, like just for all that to just take place, how it took place, like you couldn't write a better story, you know? So did, did, did it just like, when you started playing defense, like how quick did it click for you? I mean, did it quick? Did it click that instantly for you? Did it take you a while to kind of catch up to the speed of, of playing on the other side of the ball? I mean, you played against such fast speed; the speed can't, couldn't have been the issue. Probably yeah, yeah. Speed. Honestly, like the fir- just the biggest thing at first was just learning the playbook. Yeah, football is football at the end of the day. No matter what level you're playing, like you know, you play the game since you're five. They don't change how big the field is. You know, it's the same field you play since right. you're young. So at the end of the day, it's it's just ball. But yeah, so at first, just you know, getting the playbook, it was a little frustrating. But the thing that was so awesome about Coach McKenna was he was like, look, man, like, I know you've been in a bunch of different places. Like, uh, you're my guy. Like, I don't care how many times you mess up during practice. Like, I believe in you and I know that you're going to be great. So, like, playing for someone like that, like, knowing that you can make mistakes, like, it was just – it was what I needed. Like, you know, it was – I couldn't have asked for a better coach. I couldn't have asked for a better system. So, he – Coach McKenna, I know I've said his name a bunch of times, but hey, you keep saying yeah. it, dude. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, where yeah. when you start taking off even more, like this guy's gonna become like a full carol. Like, really, <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for you, is like you just mentioned, like not being afraid to make a mistake. Is that yeah. next level of D one? Is like if you just make a mistake, are you buried? I mean, is it is it really kind of like that? Like make one or two mistakes it could cost your reps and and maybe even where you are in the depth chart. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's just how it goes. And it was funny because my dad would always say like, especially last year, he was like, you know, it's nice that you can just play football because at UMass, I was trying to, you know, prove a statement that I, I can play here. And then at Indy, you're trying to prove a statement that I can get out of here. Yeah. So you're always just trying to prove something, putting so much pressure on you. And then my dad was just like, you can just tell like, you're just, you're free. It's like you're in high school again. You're just playing ball. So that was that was the biggest thing, because, yeah, unfortunately, you know, at those higher levels and stuff, the, the margin of error is slim because, you know, yeah, there, there's there's four other guys who are just as good, if not better than you. So. Wow, it's crazy. Yeah, it's a crazy it, world. It is like, I, you know, you, you hear it and you think it and then to hear you say that just to, like that stood out. I was like, wow, like that's it, at yeah. the next level. It must be just you make a mistake. If you're not mentally, you know, if you can't be yeah. that that mental toughness, like it can mm-hmm. kill people. Like not, you know, not literally, but like it can destroy them mentally and destroy their them. game and mm-hmm. they don't play. Yeah. Um, when did you start maybe getting some national recognition at Framingham or maybe, I don't know if there was a game that put you on the map or something like that, but when did you start maybe first getting those sniffs or the school started, they started getting some recognition like, hey, this kid is throwing up some sort of numbers here. Yeah, so initially it was the, the game that I was – it was kind of like my coming out party, so to speak. It was definitely that second game against UMass Dartmouth. Yeah. The stats had me at 14 tackles, but I, you know, did my own homework, and I definitely had more than 14 tackles, but yeah. I'll take the 14. So that game there, I think I had five or six TFLs and, like I said, 14 tackles. So that game was – that kind of really started to put me on the map. Like, Hey, like who's this kid at Framingham state. And then I think like midway through the season, I was just like looking at the stats and just, you know, on like the NCAA website. And I was like, Whoa, I'm like fourth in the country for TFLs. I'm like fifth for sacks. I was like, this is insane. (laughs) That's wild. dude. I mean, that's you doing your own homework essentially too. Like you don't do that. You would never know that, you know, I would have known. Yeah. I literally was just at home on Sunday after our game on Saturday and I was looking and I was like, yo, like, this is crazy. <laughs> so did you start, 
And throughout this process, I guess I should have asked, but I, well, we're going to be talking about this more. Were you a decent like social media presence at that point for yourself? Were you big on Twitter, big on Instagram, as far as your football stuff? Like you are now, like your Instagram is, whew, it's going to keep going. But like at that time, were you as active social media wise for yourself? Um, I wasn't as active just because, so my TikTok originally blew up when I was at independence, just because, you know, last chance you, people are so interested in it. So I definitely capitalized on that. But then once I got to Framingham, I kind of took a, I didn't want to be on social media. I just wanted to focus on what I had to focus on. So it really wasn't until like midway through that season where I was getting the stats and stuff that I was like, Oh, I got to start promoting this again. I got to start getting on Twitter. I got to start getting on Instagram. And my story obviously has you know, it kind of just sells itself. You know, I don't mean to sound like, you know, arrogant or anything like that. It's, no, just, no. it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy ride. So I think I've always just kind of had, I was just had that knack for just being able to promote myself. I don't know why or how it came, but I was always good at Twitter in high school and just being able to, you know, get my, my stats, my film out there. And then obviously like through TikTok and stuff, but, but yeah, like halfway through the season is when I started to promote it again on Twitter, started blowing up, started blowing up. So, I was, oh, dang. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, honestly, if I could compliment your social media here for a second, I think what draws people is kind of like your voice and how well spoken you are and how confident you are in yourself and your story is interested. And I think you do such a great job of that. And even like some of your cut ups on the podcast that you're on, like you hit the right things. I think you're pretty smart in how you advertise and promote yourself truthfully and seeing the hits that you're getting. It, it's definitely showing for sure. Um was there any for like division three? Is there like a ceremony and all? Like, were you, did you have to go anywhere for being a finalist or is it more just like they reach out to you and let you know if you won or didn't? Yeah. So actually funny how I found out I was a finalist too. It was through Twitter. I had no idea. Um, I saw them post. <laughs> I had no idea. No one told me anything. So they tweeted someone to uh, the college football network or whatever it was tweeted like, here are our finalists for, you know, all the divisions uh, players of the year and stuff. So I was like, all right, let me just check. You never know. And yeah. then I went down to D3, and the last name on it was my name. I was like, oh, snap. Right when I found that, screen recorded it, took a video. Hey, everyone, please vote for me. <laughs> like, That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was. I had no idea. Yeah. There was no, yeah, there was no, like, ceremony or anything like that. I literally just found out through Twitter. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. So you have the season of your life, mm -hmm. um, and now you have a year of eligibility left for yourself. Um, and you've in, in between you, you have now become much bigger on social media and telling your story. Where did that all kind of inspire and come from? Like you obviously had the season of your life. Was it just like, man, I got to tell my story where you approached like in, in, in that realm? Like, mm -hmm. how did you start becoming such just a bigger social media presence in general? Yeah. So, um, I knew that if I was going to enter the portal that I was going to have to do a lot of work to get the offers that I felt like I deserved. Like I definitely had a great season, but going from D3 to D1, like what I wanted to do that that's hard. Like, especially with only one year left. Like if I had two years left, probably would have been a little different, maybe some like bigger schools, but one year left, like I had to really promote myself. So right then and there, I was like, okay, I might as well. Like I made a video on TikTok just, just saying like, Hey, I'm the most underrated linebacker in the transfer portal. Yeah. And it, it blew up. I got some offers off of it. Like it just, it's, and then once one came in, the rest just started pouring in. That's, that's awesome. So you get, they reach out to you just to understand how it works. So they'll reach out yeah. to you in the portal based off of what film that they see mm -hmm. and statistics or whatever. And they're like, Hey, we're really interested in you. Yeah. And then throw you an offer right there. And then type style. How yeah. So, um, I think which one was my first offer in the portal? So you went to the portal and you're kind of just in like a database and then Twitter is really where it's active. So I was on Twitter every day and it helped because like I was getting like the accolades and stuff like that. So I had something to tweet. So I was like, oh, here, just won this. Here are my stats. So I was just on it. Like every day I was posting something. I was like, yo, I want a coach to see my name every single time he goes on Twitter. I want him to be annoyed at how much he sees my name. <laughs> So, yeah, I got my I think it was Seton Hill uh, D2 in New Jersey was my first offer. And I knew I just needed the first one. And then once the first one came, schools were like they already saw that I had one offer. So and they know I'm a grad transfer. So there's no time really being wasted because signing day was so close from the last game. Like when I entered the portal, I think I had a month and a half, maybe two. So the ball had to get rolling fast, which was helped me out, uh, helped me out a lot. So, yeah, schools would just reach out. Uh, we talk and then they would just you know extend an offer. 
I mean, that's crazy. And then obviously you made the decision to go to central Connecticut mm -hmm. state, correct? So yep. yeah, I got a right. university. What, what made you kind of pick there? What made you say, this is like, you know, my, my last year of college football, mm -hmm. was it more of a local thing or was it just, you bought it the type stuff? Like what, what, what is that decision making for you? Yeah. So it came down to central Connecticut and then North Alabama offered me pretty late. They offered me like two or three weeks before signing day. Mm -hmm. And I kind of already did the far away from home thing. Uh, I didn't want to do that again. And then it was funny because the defensive coordinator at Central, I've known him since I was a junior at Malden High. Uh -huh. So he, he, you know, he was recruiting me when I was in high school. And then actually he tried getting me out of JUCO too. He was recruiting me in JUCO. And then, yeah, he kind of, it was just always, he kind of just showed up. And it, for me, it was like, okay, this is my last year. Like, if I want to get to where I want to go and pursue my dreams, this year has to go just how last year went. I can't afford to go in a situation where, you know, I'm in Alabama or say I went or central Missouri, another school I was looking at where nobody knows me, you know, it, it's good to be in that. For me, I felt like it was good to be in that local presence. You know, I was in Connecticut for two years. So people in the area know me, like it just, it kind of just made the most sense to, you know, uh, Oh, what happened? You're good. I can see you. I can see you. You might have just clicked off the screen. Oh, I've done that so many times. <laughs> that scared me. I was like, no, because I know. No, like don't even I'm... worry. Don't even worry. Ah, cool. Um, that's the the, the the Zoom side of things. <laughs> it never. Yeah. It's all unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no. To me, I just find that so interesting because here you are, like you are making that final decision. And I wasn't sure if some of it was schematic. I mean, we talked a little bit about you playing running back, you know, and schemes kind of a big thing. I didn't know if you fit well into that scheme. I mean, what was the scheme of framing him state? Were you a forefront or a three front? Yes, we were in a forefront and uh, played a lot of man. And, and honestly, I, I got to blitz a ton. Yeah. Lot, Central does that a lot. We're more, we're mainly a three down, but we go four down too. Okay. And um, the way... They they want me to initially learn Mike, but both of the linebackers in our system are so interchangeable. Yeah. So it it really was just another perfect situation. I felt like I'm gonna have you know more free reign, kind of like I did at Framingham. It really just fits my game. Like it's 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 not a lot of thinking. You know, I can just play ball. I I know the coach. I know the defensive coordinator. Right. So it was, yeah. So in in a sense, it was definitely schematically too, for sure. Yeah. All it all kind of just fit perfectly. And that's great, you know, especially playing inside like that. Like, if you're playing a lot of man, right? Like, college football, yeah, that 245 or 50 pound linebacker just doesn't like, you know, exist in that sense right. anymore. That they play all three downs where you can have more speed on the field. Yeah. And when you are playing man, that means you can take more chances of sending heat from all different ways. Right. So, yeah, it probably does fit you well. Um, Obviously, social media wise, we kind of hit upon this, but I want to go just backwards here a little bit. I'm noticing that you're branding yourself a little bit too. You kind of have your own swag coming out, your mm -hmm. own line. I mean, how is it? You just is it because of your just blowing up lately on this stuff on TikTok and on Instagram and everything else that you're kind of looking at this as a way to really get your story out there? I mean, is there a bigger plan of telling your story? And I maybe you haven't even thought about that yet because football is what's on your mind, but mm -hmm. I'm just interested because you have a tremendous story here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I dropped my own, started, you know, doing the whole clothes and stuff like that. Uh, I signed with an, NA, an NIL agency and they were kind of pushing me like, hey, you know, you're big on TikTok, but you, you got to start posting yourself more on Instagram and because I always kind of looked at it as like, okay, TikTok, TikTok, but you know, Instagram is more like personal. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, that's just not really what Instagram is anymore. So it isn't, yeah. And, and, and two, like I always looked at it as, you know, growing up and, and and being in high school, I always was trying to find the guy who who was the underdog. I was trying to find the guy who had the similar story. So the biggest thing and the coolest thing for me is like I'll have kids reach out and be like, hey man, like I saw your story. Like I'm going through similar stuff. Like and I think that's priceless at the end of the day. Like, you know, the accolades are cool, you know, being able to grow myself, you know, it, it's a blessing. It, it's awesome being able to like share that, have that platform. But at the end of the day, being able to just inspire someone, you know, and just be like, hey, you know, if you don't give up, no matter how hard it gets, you you can do it, you, you, no matter what's thrown at you. So that that's honestly what 
so I guess in a sense, you know, something bigger, like I haven't really, really thought about it, but I have an idea of where it's going in terms of just trying to grow my personal platform and grow my brand as a whole. Mm -hmm. But being able to do it in more of like a genuine matter and, and do it with a, a story behind it, it, it is just the coolest thing for me. Yeah, I I love that you just said that because honestly, like for this, like building this, like I'm a fifth grade teacher. I mean, that's like my main job. But this being a high school coach for so long, this is what was missing locally mm. and to be able to tell these stories right. and being able to no one would know things like if you didn't do homework yeah. on yourself, you would have never known you were a finalist for something or that you were even contending to be top in the nation in that stuff. I mean, that's like you said, the whole time you're betting on yourself here and you're doing it in a way through hard work and dedication and living in the gym and, you know, betting on yourself, like all of those qualities that people do to become so successful and you're doing it yeah to me i i found it like man this kid's got something building even more for himself and yeah so that's why i asked the question <laughs> there was a great yeah. answer there for you but you. you keep doing what you are doing there because i'm like there's a lot of people in malden that i've reached out to that i'm just like who's this kid? Like, I've, you know, like as far as like, you guys should be all over this right now, you know, like athletically, because yeah, I think especially going into the season, I mean, do you have goals for yourself for this? Do you have like individual goals that you've set in your head as far as what you see for yourself? Yeah. Um, so I think my kind of, my thought process has just been um, just do it again do what I did last year and, but do it at this level because yeah, you know, I had a great season and, you know, I'm super, super blessed to be in this position that I'm in, but I know that the question mark is, can he do it at the division one level? So I'm just going to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm just going to do it again. And that's like, is that something you need to prove to yourself or is it something that you want to prove to yourself is this a big thing for you like you saying that like how big is that for you on a personal level um yeah I think it is uh at the end of the day being able to come back what I've came back from and you know it's 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 great I'm I didn't think I'd be in this position you know but I think for sure I, for me to prove it to myself that I can do it at this level is is huge at, at the end of the day, like people are always going to say what, what they got to say about anything. You could be the best person in the world. It's going to be someone that doesn't like you, unfortunately. Yeah, so right. for me, it's, it's honestly, I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just trying to prove it to myself. I'm trying to prove to my family, the, the, the ones that have made sacrifices and have believed in me that, you know, they did it for a reason. And like, I, like I said, I just want to prove it to myself. Good for you, man. It's incredible stuff. Um, the last question that I'm going to ask you, the last topic I just want to throw at you is I, our audience ranges from 18 to 42. Right. We are like a third, a third, a third, yeah. but that 18 to 24 demographic to me, this question, I always like to kind of throw out there for, for the younger kids a little bit too. What would be your advice to like young high school athletes, juniors and seniors who are looking to play collegiately at that next level? Um, what would be your advice to them as what they should be doing, what they should start thinking of maybe stuff that you didn't even know or think of yourself uh, in that process when you were going through it. Right. Um, so I think the biggest thing for a high school kid right now and looking for your next school is to make sure it's the best overall fit for you and no one else, not your parents, not your friends, not because they got the nice logo or they got all the gear or, or you're chasing whatever it is that you're chasing. Obviously like you have your goals, have your plans, but at the end of the day, you have to go to a spot that is the best fit for you. Because if you're not in that spot, like, yeah, it was, it was cool. Like being able to play in every division, like that, that's cool. But at the end of the day, like, that's not something you want to do. You, for me, you know, I, I always wish that I could have been somewhere and, you know, stayed there. Cause at the end of the day, like you're, you're, you're with these guys and, you know, having to learn new faces and every, all that is, you know, not ideal, you know, it's cool. But so for me, I would just say, just try and find that perfect fit for you, regardless of the division. Don't get caught up in the D1, the D2, the D3. Go somewhere that you're happy. Go somewhere that fits you personally, academically, athletically. And just overall, just, you know, obviously, like I said, have your goals, have that. But don't forget what it, it's just it, we're playing a kid's game at the end of the day. You know, it, it's fun. We get to have fun. Not, not too many kids can say, oh, I played in college. And I, I know what how social media is. Everyone wants to go D1 which is great. You know, it, it, it's awesome. 
but you got to go somewhere where where you can play where they're going to value you where they're going to treat you right and um yeah so that's the biggest thing don't don't get caught up in the hype you got to find the spot that's perfect for you and you know if your end goal is to get to the highest level possible there's many many different ways to get there yeah. not everyone everyone's route is different i wish for me that when i was in high school i wasn't comparing because i was looking at this kid like oh how does he have this offer all that and the whole time i'm not even enjoying where i'm at right now yeah so i think everyone has their own race everyone has their own journey and i think you got to just embrace it you know there's no perfect science to it there's kids in the like isaiah like the perfect example boston college wouldn't even offer him wild <laughs> but, you know what i'm saying yeah so it's like there's no perfect science i've seen kids that are five stars and that never pan out i've seen kids that walk on and now they're in the nfl like there's no perfect science everyone's journey is different and you just got to embrace your journey yeah it, you're so right though like it's and then and then you die you dive deeper into it and then it could be coaching it could be scheme it could right, be like right, so right. many other there's things so that many jump that. into it like it, the elements are wild dude yeah. so but regardless, like you said, like everybody wants to go D1 and do that, right. do that thing. But like how many people are willing to put in the work that you put into right. to go where you are going right now right. and doing what you're doing that people say they want to do it. People say they want to work grind and this and that, but who's putting in that work. And that's the difference. And these are the stories that we hear. And these are the people like you, man, like. If I was a college coach, like, hell yeah, dude, why just hearing your story alone, like program wise you want the you want you in your program we want you in your program because your story is incredible and on top of you can ball like you can ball on top of it like so it's not like a story that yeah you're this guy who's coming in on third down or playing here and there like you can ball three down backer like that makes the story even greater man so continue to do what you do we'll follow you here anything we can do for you just let us know and, and we will but i appreciate your time today and it's been great it's been great awesome i appreciate you for uh for having me this was awesome this was uh this was this was really cool i'm excited we got to do this yeah absolutely so guys we got a busy weekend coming up we got coverage all weekend so we're gonna be at salem state saturday we're super excited about senior night hockey uh but next week, we're pretty loaded up schedule, too. So uh, big time, fun time for beyond. And uh, till next time, guys.